friends. Uh, I'm Fredrik Fixe, Executive Vice President at Business Sweden, and I'm happy to be here at COP26 together with the smartest, uh, sharpest uh, Swedish company frontrunners in pioneering the possible to keep the 1.5 alive. And today it's the Transportation Day at COP26, and it's a true pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to this important session on charging networks in Europe. Now, Without acceleration in the development of the, of the efficient uh, charging network, we risk to fail in keeping the 1.5 alive. Transportation is one of the key sectors uh, in accelerating the climate transition, and we expect electrification of transport to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by up to 90%. Now, in this, we have the cars, the buses, the heavy-duty trucks uh, we, that we expect to run on batteries and perhaps on, on other fuels. Uh, but to make that possible, we will require a charging network. And the road to an efficient charging network throughout Europe holds many pitfalls and challenges, both for policymakers and for the industry, such as the standardization, the regulation, the financing, and the new partnerships that we see are needed, the new business models throughout the whole transportation value chain and the transportation system. And we do not have much time. Without the charging infrastructure, EVs will not scale. And in the end, every fraction of a degree counts to keep the 1.5 alive. So let's possible the, uh, pioneer the possible in charging networks. We have 45 minutes, and it's a pleasure to welcome the panelists on stage, uh, Joachim Rosenberg. Uh, Executive Vice President, Head of Volvo Energy. We have Volker Ratzmann, uh, Executive Vice President, Pub Corporate Public Affairs at uh, Deutsche Post and uh, DHL. Uh, we have uh, Patrick Carey, uh, Vice President, Global Commercial Road Transport, Shell. Welcome. Axel Fölkeri, Deputy Head of Unit B4, Sustainable and Intelligent Transport, Director General Move, EU Commission. And we have Frank Mullon, President, E-Mobility, ABB. Welcome, and Simon Duncan, Director B2B of Solutions at E.ON. Now let's give our panel a warm hand. First, we'll start off this session by inviting you, Joachim, from Volvo Energy to set the stage. Please, Joachim, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Frederick. It's really great to, to be here. And uh, of course, uh, welcome uh, everyone and distinguished panel online. So from a Volvo Group perspective, we of course both subscribe to and applaud the, the Paris Agreement and we are shooting for the 1.5 target, etc. We are meshing ourselves through the SPTI framework, amongst others. But having said that, we are now six years later from Paris and I think it's clear that we need to speed up to get up to speed. For us in the Volvo Group, that means that we need to accelerate our investments in order to make sure that we have vehicles that are 100% safe, 100% more productive and 100% fossil free. And we will do that across the 190 markets in which we operate. But what we do in the Volvo Group alone is not enough. Partnership is the new leadership. And therefore, industry collaborations need to happen in an increasing extent. We need to transition from the current brown platform that we are used to into a green platform. And that green platform needs to be environmentally sound, economically viable, and way more socially inclusive than what is the case today. This requires a step change in collaboration, which means that policymakers also need to allow us in the commercial sector to form those platform kind of collaborations within the transport sector, but also likely in other sectors. In addition to that, we're looking to policymakers to allow us to make sure that we have green energy availability, access to grid, speed up permits, and of course also set the price on harmful substances like carbon emissions. Together we feel that we can move from individual success to collective significance and we think we should do it now. Thank you so much and back to you Frederick.
Thank you very much, Joachim. And, and uh, one thing that we see here at COP26 is how important it is with collaboration. And I, I, I specifically like uh, your your, uh, uh, your point here that partnership is the new leadership. And uh, by that, I would like to in, invite the panel by asking questions to everyone in the panel. Uh, we need to speed up the transition uh, to green road freight transport in Europe. What can you as a company or organization or policymaker do to jointly secure a fast build-up of the charging network for heavy-duty trucks across Europe. And I think we'll start with you, Falker, at, the, at Deutsche Post uh, DHL. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, not only during the pandemic, but in the, uh, at the moment now, we see how important supply chain, global su supply chains are. And we see increasing volumes uh, that we had to transport. We are connecting people all over the world, and we are improving their lives by uh, shipping and delivering uh, their their goods. We as a company has committed to the Paris uh, uh, targets uh, a long time ago, and I think we are now in a period we, where we need to set up the models, the business models, and the technolo and technology, and to, to adopt it, that we can just make our promises that we made become real. And as one of the or the biggest logistic company in the world. We feel the responsibility to shape the market, to set the standards, and to give blueprints and uh, for others acting as a Roman. I think this is what we can do, and therefore we need partners in industry, but also in, in, in politics. And no doubt, to create the infrastructure to use all this technology, which we want to, to get from the market and which we need from the market, is key. And therefore, I think we need the money, but we also need clearance and we need the guidance from the politicians that they will just set up regulations and systems that we can invest and, and do the investments that, that's been needed to adopt all these technology. But I think it's, it's also their job to, to, to build all uh, the infrastructure with our help, but in guidance that, and, 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 and in, the, in, the, in the, the seriousity and the knowledge that we are going to build up an infrastructure would Less, uh, which has to work over the next decades. It's not only some years that uh, they should be usable, it's decades because we, we, we committed ourselves to spend 7 billion euro until 2030 in new technologies and be transforming our, our uh, company into more sustainability. We have very ambitious targets uh, on a science-based target uh, and we want to achieve the, the uh, Paris Agreements uh, target. So I think this is, it's totally right. We have to align, we have to join forces, but not only within the industry, also with politics and with, with, uh, with policies. Uh, and I think if we do so, we really can uh, do uh, very important steps forward to reach the goal, to make the, the world a better place. Thank you very much, Volker. Uh, I'll, I'll hand over the word to, to uh, Patrick from Shell, please. Yeah, thank you very much, and and I would very much like to um, to echo uh, what you, both Joachim and Volker have said, which I think were were very very sensible and very important comments on the topic. Um, this fundamental trans transformation will not happen without partnerships, partnerships with the different players that are assembled on this call. But indeed, as Volker is rightly saying, in my view, also under clear. Uh, guidelines and with the support of the regulator, i.e. Uh, the various, the EU obviously, but also the national governments. Um, maybe before we talk a little bit more in detail about what that means or what, what, what is required, I mean, maybe just for the avoidance of doubt from a Shell perspective, our intention in that space, we today are the leader in European road transport. We have a network that gives us a double digit, a clear double digit market share in European road haulage as far as refueling is concerned. We are determined to not only keep but also build this market share in our position with customers uh, in this space. And we are very clear that electrification will be a critical technology for that and that electrification is needed for the medium to long haul transport to achieve the CO2 reduction goals that we all collectively have set ourselves, and rightly so. So for us, that means investment. It means investment in charging infrastructure in three areas, 
on the go, very important. We have about 400 dedicated truck network sites across Europe. Um, so we will need to convert some of those and potentially new sites, but also at destination sites. We can think about logistics, parks, harbors, ports, etc. cetera. Um, and certainly, of course, at fleet depots. I mean, those are the points where electrification will be critical. And we want to play a role in all three, but first and foremost, of course, on the go, which is where our the heart of our business today is and lies. And I think we may have the opportunity later on to talk a little bit more from an infrastructure point of view that we bring what we think is required, but just to maybe kick it off uh, from a Shell perspective with that. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, and we will get back to that. Uh, Axel uh, from the EU, EU Commission. Yes, uh, thank you all. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, even. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I think the topic is very high on the political agenda. Um, particularly, you have seen that as of 14th of July, the European Commission, we have a table to proposal for a new regulation on alternative fuels infrastructure deployment with a particular focus also on specific requirements for the build up of dedicated recharging and refueling infrastructure for heavy duty trucks alongside the TNT core and comprehensive networks, so the main network of uh, transportation within the EU, including also the urban nodes. Um, I think from a regulatory point, it is still a challenge because, and it was noted in the introduction, we are still lacking um, sufficient understanding of um, sort of standardized elements uh, of this recharging and refueling um, system ahead. Nonetheless, um, we need to act now. This is why with our regulation, we have proposed, um, I think, what we consider a flexible but amb ambitious approach with a clear power output requirements for a maximum distance on the 10T, so that we can ensure that every 60 kilometers on the 10T core and every 100 kilometers on the 10T comprehensive, there is a opportunity to recharge and refuel. And we will see how the future work on standardization will come in and close. And I'll take it as, a, as an opportunity to note that we need to have an achievement on the megawatt charging standard very rapidly. Um, but so that we enable this backbone of recharging and refueling infrastructure, there is a lot of financial support available also through different uh, EU financial instruments. And But just to let we conclude on another point in this uh, discussion, and that is it is not only necessarily the finance which is a problem. The problem is, in many cases, also the planning and the permitting, and we think we'll discuss it in a minute. And here, of course, it is much more up to the national and local authorities um, mm. to get the act together. And what we're trying to do from the Commission is to facilitate good practice exchange so that we get to a speedier and more resilient and reliable planning and permitting process so that we can actually realize the infrastructure projects that we have within the time that we want them to, to be realized. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Axel. Uh, interesting points there, uh, also on the financial financing side. Uh, the, uh, Frank from ABB, welcome. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I mean, I can right now just echo what the colleague said from uh, um, like, like Axel, Patrick, and Volker on, on one hand, uh, but also if you look at the um, at the emergency we have, right? I mean, uh, I think this is COP26. Right? <laughs> we we really still should have the ambition to come down to 1.5. I mean, even if uh, now higher numbers are even debated, but if we if you still want to have the ambition to achieve 1.5, and if you try to make the math on how much actually um, is um, how much emission heavy duty transportation creates, this is enormous, right? And if you then translate that into a reduction target and what that reduction target would mean for um, electrification of heavy duty, uh, then you, you come roughly to about more than 50% of all trucks sold by 2030 need to be fully electric in order to reach this target. So in 2030 is in eight years. 
50% of the fleet, and we're just starting. Um, and and I think Axel mentioned it on the on the megawatt charging standard. I mean, we're we're in the middle of it. I mean, we're um, we're, we're part of this uh, these premiums defining uh, the standard and then trying to to get a grip on it. And uh, um, as long as we're not there, this is a hurdle for everyone investing. Right? And, mm. and I I almost feel like I mean, in ABB we're in this business um, since since more than ten years. Right? So we started actually 2010 2011. The first charging networks. These were the uh, first countrywide charging networks in uh, Estonia, Netherlands, Denmark at that time. So really pioneering. And uh, but this was for fun. Uh, right now we're the market leader actually in buying uh, charging infrastructure and solutions. But uh, I almost feel it's like a throwback uh, here with our talk trucks. Mm. Talk about uh, like. Of where these charges be put, then I'm, I'm of course happy saying, yeah, we have the hubs, let's electrify them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, will that be enough? Because the reach is different. So probably you need more, right? Um, so let's let's really jointly work on this. And when it comes to policies, um, probably one one more thing to add. I mean, we see on a at least countrywide, European wide is different, but uh, countrywide we see a lot of subsidies. Um, going into, um, it, uh, like here in Germany, home charging, or be it like uh, charging for um, for the normal CPO, so for the charge point operators, um, we do not see so much um, really for fleets. Yeah? So um, because that is treated as uh, that's a commercial operation, and a commercial operation is uh, follows the TCO logic, right? So, however, I mean, they're probably from an imp- on the climate, um, I think here we could do much more if we would focus on that. Yeah. So that, mm. that's that's. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, Simon, welcome from Eon. Hello and good evening, everyone. I concur with my colleagues. For us at Eon, we can help businesses and governments find practical solutions to the energy challenges, whether that be in capacity, renewable sourcing, or physical construction of infrastructure solutions like EV, all towards a net zero future and no more than the 1.5 degrees. Um, We're 80,000 people over 13 countries serving over 50 million customers, uh, and we're leading the transition to improve people's lives. So depending on European geography and local conditions, it requires that cal- uh, that collaboration we've been talking about with experts like us, with a thorough understanding of policies, grants, energy infrastructure solutions to power electrification, and then that engineering expertise to deliver it. As I, I find there's never a one size fits all approach in my experience. At, uh, at Eon, we partner with like-minded organizations to solve problems and come up with solutions that not only give customers what they need, but deliver net zero ambitions and provide sustainable solutions that meet the evolving needs of the future. In practical, concrete terms, which is what's most important here, in this space, we're already operating bus charging depots in Scandinavia. We're working, uh, developing charging solutions for uh, emerging battery trucks. And we've connected thousands of domestic and B2B charge points all across Europe like last month where we commissioned over 400 charge points across the UK rail network with a package solution from our Eon Drive team. Uh, right now, I, I agree with what everyone said. We need to accelerate the action to make sure solutions are best suited to specific needs, businesses and locations. And there are both opportunities and challenges that uh, come from that, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get to talk about uh, as we go on. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, we'll move on to, or would you like to add uh, something, Joachim? Yes, I, thank you, Fredrik. Yes, I would like to add a little bit. I think if we look at the transport mission that a typical transporter has, you have your home depot, you're on the road, and you're at your destination. The responsibility for the home depot is pretty clear, and the res- responsibility for the destination is generally also pretty clear. So what we're really talking about is who will take the responsibility to make sure that we have charging infrastructure on the road, so to speak. If we look at the situation today, the last time I checked, there are less than 10 10 
high performance charger across the entire continent of Europe. According to the ASEA report recently published, we need 15,000 on the road by 2025 and 50,000 on the road by 2030. So how do we get from 10 to 15,000 and on to 50,000? And here, if we start with ourselves, we need to dig where we stand. Partnership is the new leadership. And therefore, we are forming horizontal collaborations with other players in the value chain. A specific example is the JV that we announced from the Volvo Group together with Daimler and Trayton in July this year, where we will aim to have 1,700 charging points for trucks on the road within five years from the formation of that JV, which is sometime in the beginning of next year. Now, we think we need to accelerate, and I can only agree with Axel. So we feel that we cannot wait with all respect for the policymakers. We're taking the initiative. We're asking policymakers to allow these green platform collaborations and then allow us, of course, to compete on that platform. Of course, the platform should be neutral for all players. And but what the policymaker, what we're expecting is to make sure the access to the grid as well as the speed of permits, because mm. that is sort of out of our hands. Mm. And I can understand Axel pointing to the, to the member states and saying, you know, it's in their hands. Absolutely. But I think from the commercial side as well as from the EU regulatory side, we need to come together and also with the member states agree on what is a reasonable timeline to make this happen. If we stick to the current timeline, as uh, was pointed out, it will be too late. C can I take some time just to ask that question quickly? Yes or no question? I mean, if, if, if we are where we are now and at the speed and the pace what, uh, what we're doing now, uh, will we make it on time or not? And I understand that you, Joachim, said no, we will not really make it. Well, I mean, we are taking the responsibility to change the speed. Yeah. If it continues at the current speed, the answer is no. Falco, mm. uh, uh, yes or no? I think you're on mute. Uh, you're on mute, Falco. No, I'm not on mute. Oh, sorry. Yes, now we hear you. Yeah. Welcome. Hey, so, no, I, 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 I agree. We will not make it uh, if we stay to the the uh, uh, current speed. But the big question is how to accelerate. What, what could we do to, to, to make this happen much faster? So, um, well, when I look in Germany to the, the charging points in the, in the, in the uh, um, normal uh, uh, sector, so the personal, um, I, I, and I compare what Tesla does and what the public sector does, I really see that if I come to a, to a space where to, to load my, my electric vehicle, I see 20 charging points from Tesla, and I see only two which, which are, uh, could, could be used publicly. So I think if we wait for the public sector, we will not make it. Mm. So I, I think it's the initiative of that's what, 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 what Volvo does, I think, and we, we need private investment in building up these charging points and we, 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 we need to make up business models uh, uh, on this. And I think the only thing the, the public sector has to do is allow the access to the grid and building up new renewable energy that we can feed the grid with renewable energy and not with fossil produced energy. I think this is the two things they have to do. Mm. Let's stuck to the industry and let's stuck to the private investments and sector to build up enough starting, it's much faster than, we, than waiting for the public sector. Thank you. Frank, yes or no? Yeah, I have my doubts. Right? I have my doubts. I mean, seeing uh, all the hurdles, um, I, I definitely, um, the public sector will not make it. That, that's, I think, very clear. I mean, uh, uh, nowhere where you wait for, uh, for public or for the, the big one up there, that, that will not work. You have to take it in your own hands and make it happen. And um, to, uh, to the numbers uh, used earlier, um, it's actually more than 10 high power chargers in, the, in Europe. I mean, it's actually a, a couple of thousands already, right? No, not so, for trucks. Think, uh, not, not, okay. not for trucks. Okay. I'm talking about okay. trucks. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> fair enough. That is a question of yeah, which are, ones are usable. I mean, I see 
sometimes on uh, on, on charging stations for cars, uh, also trucks charging on the CCS2 uh, standard. So, but as of course they're not laid out for this, and then and then a truck is occupying obviously space for a couple of cars, right? Mm. So, but what it, what it does say is that. Um, if there is a business case, private, and which is the case for most of the CPOs, and we have two CPOs here, I mean, we have Shell and Eon here, both uh, working exactly in that direction and building out infrastructure right now for cars as we speak. And uh, it's this, this chicken and egg topic. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, you have to start, you have to get going. And if you start investing, uh, once, yeah, partially you're the chicken, partially the egg, but you, you grow along with the industry, right? And and this growth is happening and it's happening quite fast. And I think on the on the truck side, we're running behind because of what we discussed earlier a bit on the standards. Hopefully that will be solved too. But secondly, also because of the availability of the trucks itself. And if you want to have a private business case, of course, you cannot say, um, dear CPO, please build out. Right. Uh, but yeah. on the OEM side, we wait till we come with the trucks. And the yeah. um, so um, I, I think that, that has to, to run a bit in parallel, right? So yeah. and only if this runs in parallel, you create a business case. Mm -hmm. so, so in one way, when we... I mean, we're, we're looking at having the truck, so the chicken is almost here. Uh, so it's time to start laying the egg. But let's let's turn to the CPOs, Eon and Shell. What's your yes or no? What do you think? Uh, should we start with with uh, Simon, Eon? Will we make it on time? Yeah, I mean, we. My perspective is uh, very much the one that's been it shared already that we, we can't wait for the policymakers to to move. It'll take the pioneers to act and drive the market. So we need to lobby and clear the way to make this um, this easy for ourselves. But um, it, it's going to take those um, those at the at the kind of cliff edge to, to jump off and go first to make sure that um, the, the market follows and, uh, and and catches up catches up with us. Mm. Uh, Patrick? I think very simply we are in this call, all of us because we want to accelerate. We wouldn't be here if we didn't think that was a good idea or that's, that's what we would need to do. So I would take that as a firm commitment that we will want to build this market. I tried to explain earlier uh, uh, by saying that we feel we have a vested, also commercial interest, in mm. addition to the societal interest that I think is obvious and that, that obviously drives us, including myself as a citizen, by the way, but we have a marked commercial interest uh, to make this happen and to make this a success. So I think that is there, mm. but it is clear, as Joachim said at the very beginning, a partnership is required because different things need to come together. For example, it's been mentioned, the availability of green electrons. We, we think from a shell perspective that we'll probably need around 50 terawatt hours just to power battery electric vehicles in 2030 in Europe. Now that has to come from somewhere. We will, as Shell, play our part in producing it, rest assured. We will play our part in putting the sites in the ground, rest assured. And by the way, I think the good news is that we bring, and others as well, but you know, we see ourselves as the market leader, as I said, we bring a lot to the table because it is not just, of course, about putting a charger into the ground and connecting into the grid. That's difficult enough, as we've just said. It is also about combining it with a 40 minute rest period for the driver, having an offer for the truck and in particular the driver, someone we haven't talked about much in this call, but I think we should, uh, around this. So it needs infrastructure that goes just beyond the flow of electrons, critical to make it a success, critical to achieve not just putting white elephants into the ground, but actually driving uptake of electric mobility for medium to heavy duty trucks. Mm. And there I would add, if I may, my, my point to uh, the ask, because I think sometimes the support required is, is a lot more subtle than the obvious going around with a hat and asking for subsidies. Quite frankly, I don't think anybody needs to be in the subsidy asking business in this space. But what we do need the regulator to understand at all levels, including the municipal level, is that we are investing, all of us on this call, not just Shell, all of us on this call, we are investing into a business model that has a much 
longer lead time than the traditional business model that we come from. So if we run public tenders on motorway sites, if we talk about also land uh, uh, tenders, plot tenders in municipalities, that has to be taken into account, mm. right? That is, a, that is just a reflection, I think, that's required on the part of the policy makers in the plural to take into account the new realities of this business model that we're all trying to move towards with high speed and urgency for all the reasons discussed. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and uh, Axel, it, it seems like the the, the companies are, are uh, ready and ready to to take the uh, take the challenge and ready to invest and also seem to what what I uh, hear have the guts to go ahead. What's your view? Uh, will we make it, Axel? I think we have to decompose the challenge, and I remain optimistic. And I come back to what Johan was saying in the beginning. We have home depot and destination charging clearly established. We have the technologies, we have the standardization. There's absolutely nothing that stands in the way of fully electrifying with rapid speed the urban and interurban delivery market as a first segment. We have the vehicles now, we can do that and we should do it. And then we have the question of long distance road road. And by the way, I mean, interurban delivery that will already provide a significant contribution to, to, to transport uh, emission reduction. And not fully the needed one, but an entirely uh, relevant one. And then we have long distance. And in long distance, we just have to see two different things. There's a great hesitation on the side of member states, and I'm discussing with them on a weekly basis, because the vehicles are not there yet. Yeah. And obviously you can understand in the conditions that we have now with the crisis and everything that taxpayer money is being very carefully looked at. And there's a question, when will those vehicles come? and how many will be coming into the market so that you know a policy which is pushing for an aggressive rollout of a huge recharging infrastructure is making sense. Mm. And I think that goes back to the question of the collaboration raised earlier. We need a much more timely and, 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 and broad uh, a collaboration on this issue because there is, the market is changing rapidly and the changes in the market, which, for example, are discussed in the planning of enterprises, need to normally takes their time to filter into politics. Mm. And I think we, we don't have the time for the usual processes here. It needs to be accelerated. Mm. But what I'm saying is then we need to build the trust that this market transition is happening quickly, that the manufacturers will produce the vehicles, that the operators will buy the vehicle, and then the infrastructure operators will provide the infrastructure. And I fully agree. And from our point, it is very clear. The infrastructure provision is a private market um, um, decision, and it needs to be. Mm. And it is the role of the public hand to de-risk and help the mm. private sector in taking on this challenge. Mm. And obviously, in the first years, there will be a need for public support because the business model is not there. And I think I can see that there is a willingness to play that. But I think, again, we need to establish the certainty. Mm. And I, I think that's the predominant task for now and the next months is to make clear this is going to happen and we can make it. So there's no reason to doubt. I mean, because if we start to doubt, then you are not in a convincing mm. uh, uh, argumentation position. Mm. I like, Axel, that you say within the, 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 the months here, within the few months, uh, to, take, to try to clear, provide that clarity. Uh, but let, me, let us dig into that. Uh, when will we have the vehicles? When, uh, if I ask uh, the question to you, Akim, and to, to Folke, I mean, how many and when will we have, or perhaps when will we have a, a kind of a scale up the number of vehicles in the roads? Mm -hmm. Heavy duty vehicles. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it's important to understand that the vehicles are already here. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I take the Volvo Group as an example, uh, we have, uh, you know, obviously already medium-duty vehicles. Mm -hmm. We have the lighter end of the heavy-duty, and which is public information. We will have the heavy end of the heavy-duty already next year. So this, this chicken and egg discussion, which was referred to, that game is sort of over. And that is, of course, one of the many reasons why, and I agree with Axel, you know, and I think it's clear from all the companies here, we are willing to put our money where our mouth is. We understand it's a longer game to play. Completely agree with David. You know, we need to take care of the driver. The driver has exactly the same needs, of course, mm. in terms of, mm. of food and hygiene and otherwise, also in the future. So I think all of that is clear. 
what remains, I would say, unclear, and, and uh, sorry, Axel, coming back to you a little bit on this one, right, is that even if it's clear that the Home Depot ownership is there, that company, what, whatever company we are talking about, still needs to get its permits, still needs access to the grid, and still needs to have green electrons flowing. And the problem is that that is not happening today. I had an example, which I will not quote it, but an example of a major company in the Nordic region as late as yesterday evening over dinner saying that we wanted to buy, in this particular example, more than a hundred light duty vehicles, not from the Volvo Group, because we don't do those particular vehicles. And we couldn't do it because there was no you know, uh, grid uh, available to charge those vehicles. So we had to buy diesel vehicles. And I think, I think we can all agree as, as human beings, as citizens, as, as leaders of companies or whatever, that's a shame. And that I think we jointly need to fix. And that's why I'm saying partnership is the new leadership, horizontal corporations, corporations across the value chain. From the Volvo Group side, we're doing it on the battery electric vehicle. And as some of you know, we're also doing it on the fuel cell electric vehicle. And has to happen. Mm. Scarcity in, 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 in uh, energy uh, for to, uh, and, and, and uh, hesitating to buy a hundred vehicles. I mean, that's something to bring with you in, us into this, this game. Let me turn to you, Falco at DHL. When will you scale up the number of uh, EVs? As soon as the vehicles are available on the market. And we are already partnering with Volvo. Mm. I think uh, we do some... I think we, we have a, a, a project in with 150 kilometers of distance. We are using heavy-duty electric trucks just to get experience in, in how we could run with this. But you see, we don't need one or two trucks. We need thousands. Mm. And they have to be built. And we don't need the trucks. We also re, uh, uh, need maintenance uh, for them. So we need a whole new structure. Mm. And I think we are facing somehow a kind of transition period to, to, to make all this technology we need available on the market. And it's the heavy duty vehicles, it's the medium uh, duty vehicles, and it's the light duty vehicles. It's a huge number we, 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 we know. And besides, and then there is the problem, what to do with the fossil combustion driven trucks we are running now, Where, what to do with them? Should mm. we all then shift them to Africa or, mm. or how, how should we go along with this, with this uh, uh, problem? But in this transition period, I think we have to build up the infrastructure and what Axel says, the de-risking of those who do the investments, the proper regulation on accounting for their CO2 balances uh, for those investments, to do it not only nationally, regionally, but internationally. I think those are the incentives we are waiting for, and there we need a proper uh, uh, regulation so that we can say, well, we invest our money, but we won't be sure that we at first get the, 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 the incentives in accounting for our CO2, own CO2 emissions in scope one and in, 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 in scope three. And I think we need to secure that the invested money really is going to be the ground of new business models. And therefore, I think the public sector should de-risk our investments. This, I think, is key. Mm. Today, it's the uh, day of transportation. And, and um, uh, now, let's say that we will invite you uh, to the negotiation room, and you will, all, you will actually be able to make a decision. I mean, it's your call. You can decide, and then the, uh, the, we, that's the way that will go forward. That will be the, the thing that would be written in the negotiation uh, fallout or call out uh, here on Friday. One decision. This is the last, last question. What would your decision be? You are the decision maker now. Should we uh, start with uh, Simon? It's always tricky to be the first one. Uh, so, sorry, my decision in terms of in terms of what? Oh, you could decide yourself. You're in. Oh, you're okay. in. You're in the negotiation so, room. Everyone looks at you, and you can say, "Okay, my yeah, decision so, to get this forward is." Yeah. So I mean, um, I, uh, first, I agree on uh, the on de the points about de-risking pioneers like mm -hmm. DHL and Volvo, so it doesn't feel like a gamble. I think that's important. I mean, uh, for me, scalability is really important here. It isn't just about the physical infrastructure and edge points, although. Of course, grid resilience and capacity is created through renewable generation and storage. 
I feel we need to digitize the network infrastructure of transport charging. And to do that, we need a flexible power system. And that addresses concerns of things like same time charging impacts on peak demand loads. Uh, cyber security needs to be embedded to any connected device and pattern and predictive management needs to be a big part of, uh, of that plan. And if we make this efficient and resilient just as much as it is sustainable. Mm. So um, I, I think the focus um, also needs to be on that. We need a new digital revolution to be able to predict, balance and optimize charging and grid flexibility to levels that have frankly never been seen before. So we can't just look at this as trucks and plugs, but have to look at it as a complete uh, ecosystem. Mm. Frank, uh, what would your decision be? Yeah, no, I think the, the ecosystem is already, I mean, that, that's coming, right? That's already there. We, we're in the middle of it. But I think what is, um, what is really a point, um, if I would write down a decision, it's all about reducing uh, CO2 emissions. I mean, that's why we're together, right? And, uh, and ultimately, um, I believe the trend towards battery electric uh, or fuel cell in some cases even, but for my understanding, more battery electric, um, that, that is anyway there, that will come, right? And then if I look at the total cost of ownership, what is driving an industry, I think we will see break even points somewhere around 2026, uh, where already then by then a battery electric total cost of ownership is below a diesel. So then the question is no longer there. By then, hopefully, we will also have enough vehicles. By then, we will I mean, build out structure as well. So what, what really needs to reduce the CO2 footprint is in the energy generation towards renewable. Mm. And so if I um, found one decision or to support because ultimately, all of it needs to be powered. Yeah. I, I even the 50, mega, uh, 50 terawatts <laughs> I mean, we, we even have uh, um, like 64 terawatt uh, simulated. You know, I think this is uh, yeah. this is paramount. Mm -hmm. All right, Patrick, what would your decision be? Yeah, I think I'm very much in in Frank's camp. I believe, and for me, it would be two things predominantly. Uh, one is remain technology agnostic. I think one thing that we shouldn't assume is that even from a technology point of view, we found all, all the answers today. I think we will find more answers over the next 10 years. And it is absolutely critical, I think also from a regulatory point of view, that we remain technology agnostic. What matters is CO2 reduction. That is the name of the game for all of us. And whatever pathways lead there, I think should be open. And the second point linked to that, and you may be surprised to hear that from me, seeing my company name in this, I think we need to accelerate in a planned way, in a clearly communicated way, the increase of the cost of, the, of CO2. Because that at the end of the day is the trigger or will be the trigger in a lot of the TCO decisions. I do believe that market forces work. I do believe that with everybody on this call, people assembled, there's a clear willingness to operate in the market, to see a commercial opportunity, but the external cost of the CO2 that, that is clearly there has to be internalized in the TCO uh, uh, calculations. And that is a task uh, for the regulator. And that will help, in my view, the transition or the, the speed of the transition. Thank you very much. Uh, Volker? Yeah, I, I, I think three points. The first one, just to try to get international agreements to, play, to, to create somehow a level playing field of, for, for a multinational company like ours. Secondly, don't forget the less, uh, the, 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 the less developed countries. They, they, they couldn't be the one who to, to take all the burden of our accelerated just uh, uh, revolution in, in, in technology. And thirdly, I think we have to, to do clear decisions in infrastructure because the infrastructure will determine the technology we are going to adopt to operate with. So, and I think that if we have clear guidelines in this, we will accelerate the technology operating on this grid, on this net. And then I think we, we are really good. And if we could do agreements on this internationally, I think we will, we will help the whole planet and not only Europe in reducing their CO2 emissions because you know, we need to reduce this, uh, the CO2 emission all over the world, mm. not only in Europe. Mm. 
Axel, uh, the industry is ready. Uh, companies, uh, they're ready, and the chicken is uh, is already here. So, and and uh, what, your point of view? What would you decide if you would be in the negotiation room? If we if we take the European perspective for a moment and agree that we use sort of the European lead market to push globally, then it's quite easy for me to answer. I mean, we've put forward a very comprehensive Fit for 55 package in July. We need to adopt this package as quickly as possible and hopefully as little change as possible. Because in this package, we have the ingredients that were mentioned in this conversation. We have an increase of the cost of carbon through the changes to the ETS, through the changes to the ETD. We have also a full support, also from a social perspective with the European Social Climate Fund to making this transition just. We have the, uh, I think, well-functioning already regulatory framework with the CO2 emission performance standards for the trucks subject for review next year, coupled now with a new proposal for infrastructure provision uh, with AFIR, and we cannot lose time on that. So I think if you put these regulatory proposals into place, we have a fairly robust framework to play with. And then it's just a matter of making sure that the collaboration between manufacturers, operators, and users works. And I think on that we will find um, once we have a regulatory framework in place, relatively quickly, uh, the right way forward. So let's stay optimistic because it's not good to be pessimistic. Why should? I fully agree. Fully agree. You are Kim. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I would say um, demand is already there as a backdrop. Uh, demand is there. The transport buyers, big logistics companies like Volker and DHL, uh, the demand is there. People want to have these products. So I think the, the issue is on the supply side. And I, I will steal from Volker and, and probably have three points then instead, right? One is to allow competition neutral platforms, what I call green platforms, uh, across the value chain, so that we have a common infrastructure to build on. I'll take an example. No one here, I think, believes it would be right to have the more than 100 mobile operators in Europe, as an example, build 100 different kinds of uh, telefunk towers across Europe. That wouldn't be a good idea. And so I think competition neutral platforms is one. Secondly, to facilitate this speedy access to a green energy grid wherever necessary. Even where the ownership is clear, it needs to be possible to do it. And thirdly, to set the price on harmful emissions, for instance, CO2, for instance, um, that would be a great idea. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for sharing your views on how to pioneer the possible in building up a charging network throughout Europe. Now, we're happy to have Swedish technology uh, front runners collaborating with the best international players uh, in the Swedish initiative Pioneer the Fossil Free and Pioneer the Possible to keep the 1.5 alive. And as uh, we all kind of, uh, we, we all agree that no, we will not make it on time unless we accelerate, we are short on time. Every fraction of a degree counts. Let's get to work. Thank you very much. <laughs>